the American College of Rheumatology, along with the Spondylitis Association of America and Spartan, which is Spondyloarthritis Research and Treatment Network, they came up with the treatment guidelines. So the Spartan is this organization of uh, rheumatologists within North America who are interested in spondyloarthritis study. Uh, we published our guidelines first in 2016 and the new guidelines were just presented recently at the American College of Rheumatology uh, annual meeting in Chicago in October of 2018. And these are the uh, re-edited or refurbished uh, guidelines that we had originally published in 2016. These guidelines talk about which are the patients which are appropriate for the treatment, which are the patients which are appropriate for uh, aggressive treatment, uh, how you decide about which agents to be used um, in day-to-day -day practice and the order in which you will add newer agents. So the treatment guidelines say that the first goal of therapy is to improve the signs and symptoms and treating the patient's uh, pain and fatigue uh, as well as morning stiffness. As I said earlier, uh, prevention of uh, radiographic progression is still aspirational and that is not part of these guidelines. We suggest that the first treatment uh, should be physical therapy and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. If the patient has significant symptoms and the disease is active, which according to the guidelines is the patient has significant signs and symptoms which are unbearable and which are because of the disease itself, then we go to the next stage of treatment and that is biologics. There are two classes of biologics which are currently available. One is the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors and the other one are interleukin-17 inhibitors. The tumor necrosis factor inhibitors or TNF inhibitors came into the market and got FDA approved around 2003-2004 and they are the ones that we first use after failure of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and the physical therapy. If using those also keeps the disease active, we can always change to another anti-TNF drug, uh, and this is called the secondary failure. So if somebody has good response to the first anti-TNF for some time and then they stop responding, then that's secondary failure. You can change to another anti-TNF drug. Whereas if it is a primary failure that you try somebody on anti-TNF and there is no response whatsoever, in which case you can straight go to the other class of drug, which is the IL-17 inhibitor, and there are two of those agents currently available. Um, we also talk in those guidelines about uh, use of MRI. Uh, we talk uh, in those guidelines uh, about other comorbidities such as uveitis, about IBD, uh, etc. Uh, <clears throat> we talk, we have uh, mentioned in those guidelines about whether to use uh, echocardiogram because these patients can have heart involvement, whether to use uh, osteoporosis, when to do surgery, when to send the patient for surgery, etc. So these are pretty extensive guidelines that we have uh, produced and the hope is using the guidelines will improve the care of the patient. The window of opportunity is a concept which is well developed in rheumatoid arthritis and it is well known that if you catch the patients early with rheumatoid arthritis and treat them aggressively, you are going to prevent the damage and uh, the patient will remain symptom free uh, and damage free. In axial spondyloarthritis, that concept is somewhat premature. We certainly know that finding the patients early and treating them aggressively improves health-related quality of life. We know that that prevents disability. We know that prevents premature retirement from workforce. We know that that will actually help the societal cost, individual cost, etc. Whether it really prevents progression of the disease and radiographic progression, as I said earlier, is more aspirational. There is a strong hint that we might be doing that by treating the patients early aggressively with biologics, but all those data are retrospective, not prospective. Uh, prospective data are the only way we will know for sure there is a cause and effect relationship. Currently what we think is that earlier you catch the patient and treating them aggressively is still very good because you are reducing the patient's misery. You are going to reduce their stiffness, you are going, going to diagnose them accurately you're also going to avoid unnecessary surgery that the patient might undergo by going to the wrong provider and going to avoid their long-term disability and uh, their retirement from the workforce, as I said earlier.
not all patients with non-radiographic axial spondyloarthritis progress to ankylosing spondylitis. There are several studies um, in the literature who have prospectively studied, and the numbers vary from 2% over two, 2 years to 12% over 2 years to up to 35% over 30 years. These are some of the numbers depending on which study you look at. It is also known that some patients may never convert from non-radiographic to radiographic ankylosing spondylitis. Again, as I said, it doesn't really matter because the disease burden is very similar. There are certain risk factors that we know which patients are going to convert from non-radiographic to radiographic. The first one is male sex. Males convert from non-radiographic to radiographic more. We also know that uh, patients who smoke, patients who have active disease and that is done by two ways to find out whether they have active disease or not. One is looking at the C-reactive protein and the second is the MRI scan of their sacroiliac joints. Patients who have high inflammatory burden on the sacroiliac joints are more likely to go to develop ankylosing spondylitis from non-radiographic. Those with high C-reactive protein are more likely to progress. Uh, male sex is uh, another one that we know. Uh, when it comes to X-ray progression in the spine, new development of syndesmophytes, people have also found that existing syndesmophytes is a risk factor for getting more syndesmophytes. And interestingly enough, blue-collar workers compared to white-collar workers, so extreme physical activity during your work, is a risk factor for progression of the spinal uh, ankylosing spondylitis, more syndesmophyte. That is not uh, conversion of non-radiographic to radiographic. That's the newborn formation in the spine.